It was Tuesday, February 10th, 2013. It's Sunday. Tasha Lucia, a 25-year-old co-worker of Jessica Nelson, worried Jessica Nelson when she was unable to reach her. She called her several times, but she didn't pick up. Tasha missed her shift at Locklear's Beach City Grill on Folly Beach, where they both worked, and Jessica attempted unsuccessfully all day to contact her. Jessica and a fellow employee went to Tasha's house at 5 o'clock that afternoon because Jessica had a gut sense that something was amiss and she couldn't shake it. Tasha didn't live by herself. She shared a residence with Robert Tillman Kronsberg in Charleston County, South Carolina. When Jessica and her companion arrived at Tasha's house, they repeatedly rapped on the door. No response was given. They entered after seeing that the window in the living room's front was open. When they heard loud snores coming from one of the bedrooms, they knew right once that Robert was there because he was snoozing on the bed. They asked him where Tasha was when they woke him up, but they couldn't understand what he replied because he was just muttering. They scoured the house in search of Tasha after realizing that what he was saying made no sense and discovered her lying on a bed in another bedroom. When they lifted up the sheet that was over her, they saw a large knife sticking out of her chest. Tasha was dead. The two women were so frightened that they ran outside screaming and called 911. Tasha's friends knew Robert would hurt her and some had seen her with bruises in the past, but they never thought he would kill her. They were aware that their relationship was poisonous and unstable because they frequently quarreled, broke up, and then reconciled. The police detained Robert. Based on the information gathered and the admissions made, they declared that they were done hunting for anyone else. He was accused of murder and having a weapon while committing a violent act. Rob entered a not guilty plea. The prosecution said that Robert and Tasha had an on and off relationship and frequently argued, and that on February 10, 2013, one of those disputes tragically led to Tasha's murder. Robert had a Facebook cover photo of the horrific chainsaw scene from American Psycho. They claimed that Tasha met up with friends on February 9, the day before she passed away. The jury saw photos of a happy Tasha that were taken only hours before her death, and the court heard that she had fun on Folly Beach with pals. Robert attended work that day and afterwards went to a party. But the prosecution told the jury that that didn't stop him trying to create an argument with Tasha via text messages. Tasha's behavior changed after receiving a text from Robert, according to the prosecution's testimony before the court. When they both arrived home, the fight heated up, the jury was told. See, the defendant was angry. When Tasha got home, he and Tasha argued about her ex-boyfriend and you will hear in his own words what he did to the person he supposedly cared about. The prosecution told the jury that the fight turned physical. He hit her really hard, he hit her because she was yelling for help. So what was his solution to that problem? He started strangling her, because she wouldn't be quiet. According to the prosecution, Tasha was killed on February 10th, somewhere between midnight and 2 o'clock. Detective Richard Holmes of the Charleston Police Department testified in front of the jury, saying that Tasha and Robert got into a fight over her ex-boyfriend and sex. He ended up strangling her as a result. He didn't stop there, though. After he strangled her, he was in the room and heard her gasping for air. He went in the kitchen and got a butcher knife and came back and stabbed her multiple times. Tasha was allegedly strangled, choked, and then beaten in the head with a hammer because she was yelling. She wasn't yet dead, so Robert entered the kitchen, 
grabbed a butcher knife and stabbed the woman 15 times. When her co-workers discovered her, the knife was still inside her. Robert was in bed when police arrived, and when they roused him, he sat erect and had crazy eyes, according to testimony given to the court. He appeared to be muttering, so they were unable to understand what he was saying. A bottle of vodka, some marijuana, ibuprofen, and a knife were discovered by the police on the nightstand next to the bed that he was lying in. When authorities discovered Robert, he was covered in blood and had slashes on his wrists that appeared to have been self-inflicted. His left wrist had a three-inch vertical laceration. Robert asserted that he attempted suicide twice but was unsuccessful in both attempts. The court was informed that Robert confessed to having used cocaine when he was transported to the hospital for treatment. He admitted to taking sleeping pills, aspirin, drinking alcohol, and trying to slit his own wrists, according to detectives' testimony. The prosecution presented the jury with an audio recording of what they claimed was Robert's confession. Robert was hospitalized when it was recorded. In the recording, Robert can be heard saying that he grabbed a kitchen knife and stabbed Tasha and tried to kill himself. Paul Polensky, one of Robert's buddies, testified before the court. Paul consented to give a testimony for the prosecution. They both worked together at a pizza shop on James Island, and the court learned that they were close friends. He claimed that early on February 10th, Right after Tasha had been killed, Robert's phone sent him a text message with the words 911 scrawled four times. Robert urged Paul to contact him back from the office landline rather than his mobile phone, according to Paul, who then called Robert to confirm this. When Paul did, Robert remarked, Don't freak out, but I just killed my girlfriend. Paul said that because he had known Robert for a long time and had even assisted Robert in finding employment, he assumed Robert was joking when he said that. He had worked with Robert the previous evening and was aware that Robert attended a party after work, so at first he didn't take it seriously and assumed Robert was intoxicated. He soon understood, though, that it wasn't a joke. Paul knew Robert and Tasha were bickering that night, but he was unaware of the degree of it until Robert explained what he did. Paul stated that Robert had claimed to him that he had struck Tasha, who had screamed, and that he had attempted to choke her to make her stop. Robert promised Tasha that if she would stop screaming, he would let her up. According to Paul's testimony, Robert tried to calm her down three times but she wouldn't stop crying, so he grabbed the first thing that was lying next to him. He used a hammer, which just so happened to be that thing, to strike her in the head. Paul said that he did not call the police because Robert had promised to give himself in the next day when he was questioned if he had done so. The forensic pathologist, Dr. Susan Presnell, testified in court that Tasha's death was the result of homicide, and the jury was shown photos that were taken during the autopsy. Tasha was depicted in the photos as having a black eye, a broken nose, and several scrapes and bruises on her face, lip, and neck. Some of the blows appeared to have been produced by a hammer. Tasha's chest was stabbed repeatedly as well. The hammer was discovered in the house with Tasha's blood on it, the court was informed. Chad Simpson, the prosecutor, told the jury that there should be no room for doubt regarding Robert's guilt and that it would be simple for them to convict him. The prosecutor questioned the jury, if it wasn't murder, what was it? There was no disputing Robert's role in Tasha's death, the defense said the jury. Charles Cochran, Robert's lawyer, argued as follows. This case is going to be about what was going on in his heart that night, and that's what you're going to have to decide throughout the course of this week. 
The defense argued that Robert killed Tasha, but that it actually happened during a heated altercation. Even though Robert and Tasha clashed about Tasha's ex-boyfriend, the defense maintained that her death wasn't the result of murder. It was an impulsive act of passion. The defense encouraged the jury to keep their attention solely on the facts and to suppress their emotions. Charles assured the jury that his client was not getting away with anything in this case and that instead, they were being held accountable for the right offense. He said that Robert was acting erratically in this instance and that there was no malice involved. This was all done in a frenzy, an uncontrolled frenzy with alcohol. A frenzy without the benefit of collecting one's thought. Robert wouldn't have murdered Tasha if he weren't inebriated. That evening, he was powerless to control his own behavior. The jury was informed by the judge that although Robert was charged with murder and they could find him guilty of that charge, they could also take into account the lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter and find him guilty of that charge if they felt it was appropriate given the evidence they had heard. After just over an hour of deliberation, the jury found Robert guilty of murder as well as having a weapon while committing a violent felony. At that point, Robert started cursing in the courtroom, and he had to be taken out so that he could calm down. He spoke to Tasha's mother Kimberly when he got back and said, I'm so sorry that I took her away from you. Since this was Robert's first offense, his attorney urged the judge to give him a 35-year sentence with a 5-year parole period. The court heard testimony from Robert's relatives before Judge Roger Young delivered his verdict. They informed the judge that Robert was a troubled individual who had long battled substance abuse. His daughter, his loved ones, and now his freedom had all been taken from him by his addiction. The defense's appeal for 35 years was rejected by the judge. Speaking directly to Robert, he stated that he did not think it was an act of passion and that one factor made it obvious that it was not a spontaneous act. You thought she was dead, and walked away from her. Heard that she was still alive and went back to finish her off. He went back and stabbed her and he didn't just stab her once, he stabbed her 15 times. Robert was given a life sentence without the chance of release. Robert Kronzberg was discovered dead in his cell at the Broad River Correctional Institution in Columbia on December 6, 2017. He took his own life.